Well, as we continue this series, The Disciples' Prayer, I want to say I'm so glad that you're here, that you've joined us either online or here in person. Prayer is our lifeline. And when it comes down to it, there have been few things that have meant more to me during the dark valleys of life or the struggles or keeping me grounded when I'm flying high and everything seems to be working well than prayer. And it is such a gift. We opened up this series this last week and uh, we talked about some key things I'm going to remind you a little bit of today and then we're going to go into part two. Now, if you have not signed up for the 21 days of prayer that begins tomorrow, please do today. Uh, That is an important thing that we as a church, as those who call themselves followers of God, would, would bind together in calling out to our God to heal our land, to work through us, to shine bright in the darkness, because to be blunt, our world is a mess. You know, there are times, if not careful, when we think about the world, we can just go, how do we fix it? Hey, what what do we do? It's so bad. And it seems like over this last year, we've seen some of the worst of our country, some of the worst of our society. and, And it kind of feels like it's one of those times when it's time to break the glass and pull the lever. You know, in case of emergency, break glass, pull lever. And it's like, ah, and, you know, it's called 911. And, and I need you now, God. You know, the sad thing is about this gift of prayer is that we do kind of reserve it behind a shard of glass. And we tend to only run to it in times of emergency when it's time to break the glass. Yeah. I wonder if at times it's just a misunderstanding of what our God wants to hear from us. But does he only want to hear from us in crisis times on the important stuff, whatever you define as important? Well, let me just give an analogy of this. You know, over Christmas, my kids were home. And uh, it was so good to have all three grown adult daughters there and one who's now married, so a son-in-law to join. And it's not a real big living room. They're all there and they're talking and they're back and forth and it, it, all kinds of subjects, uh, whether it was the, some silly video to whether it was I mean, laughing at the dogs to teasing one another to what we're going to have to who's doing what. And, You know, I could have just gotten frustrated. Oh, it's so noisy in here. But you know what? I stopped and I just listened and I went, it's so good to have my kids. It's so good to hear them. It's so good to be with them. See, a good father wants to be with his kids, wants to hear from them. Over the years, I, I, from when they were little, we'd talk about potty training, and then we'd talk about mud pies, and then it was boys on the playground, and it was who kissed who, and, and, and then it got up to more important stuff and direction of life and what college and where their belief systems are. Now I had to talk to them about marriage and interacting and about worldview and about politics and all kinds of other stuff, and I'm thankful to get to interact and hear from them, whether it be the small, what might be considered trivial, or the major things of life. And so can I just challenge you to join me for 21 days that together you need to understand your father wants to hear from you. There's nothing too small for him. He loves to hear from his children. See, we started that last week by really unpacking uh, our, our dad in heaven. And I know that's almost like, oh, almost, almost offensive. You know, the word dad, you can't use that for God. I mean, the whole Old Testament has references to God, our Father, and, and numerous different ways, but it is more of a general, more of a father term. And in the Lord's Prayer, when the disciples were like, teach us to pray, Jesus, he used for the first time in Greek here, Abba, as in Papa, as in Daddy, Father, our Daddy, our Papa in heaven. That's how he said to pray in verse 9. Our daddy in heaven, 
May your name be kept holy. Now, there are two sides to this. One is that he wants to draw near us. He wants to be close to us. And on the other side is he is holy. He is just. He is in all places, all places. He's in heaven and he's on earth. The scripture says he's beyond being able to be confined. He is sovereign. He's above all this stuff. And I'm so thankful that he is because this world is messy. And that leads us to a God who cares and a God who's powerful. In verse 10 today, may your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, this is important. Now, I want to make sure you get the context because the context of may your kingdom come, may your will be done here on earth, you have to know what and how they would hear it. And today, it's the same problem that's still existing. See, they would have heard this 100% political. And so he's saying, whose kingdom, first of all? It's just two simple questions today. Number one, whose kingdom? He said, may your kingdom come. Now, we have a problem. (laughs) I talked a little about this last week, is that we are selfish by nature, and I am including myself in that. You know, when I was a little kid, we didn't have Legos. We had rocks and sticks, and we played with hatchets and axes and stuff that we probably shouldn't have. And I remember as a kid, I wanted to build something, and a buddy of mine, we were in like early elementary school, we decided to build a cabin. And so we didn't have Legos to do it. We just went into the forest with a hatchet from the garage and started cutting down the little trees. And we built this little cabin, probably 10 by 10. The problem was is we got about waist high, and then we realized we didn't know how to make a door. (laughs) And so somewhere around Council Grove, there's a half-built cabin without a door. And uh, that was ours. (laughs) You know... Legos are just really cool. You can build some amazing things. And I think that there's a truth about them whenever you see kids playing with them. They're really a one-person toy. You put two brothers together, what's invariably going to happen? There are 50,000 pieces in, the, in that box probably. And yet, he has the blue one. I need the blue one. And mom, it's not fair. Johnny mocked over my tower. And They're great to just play with by yourself. And we build our towers the way we want with what we want. And it's interesting. I think that's kind of indicative of our prayer life. If not careful, it's God. Johnny has my blue Lego, and I want that blue Lego. God, it's not fair. Somebody knocked down my tower, and I don't really like it. It, it, it was my tower after all, and it's not the way it's supposed to be. And, and, and God, 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 me, myself, and I, and I don't like that about me. See, prayer is about going to him, not in selfishness, but in saying, may your kingdom come. You know, I had one of the kids in the church build me a little throne. And I was like, that's just so important to remember. God's Lego tower is so much better than ours. And I got to remember who sits on the throne. It's not me. In fact, it's all him. When John the Baptist was announcing the coming of the Savior that had been long awaited, In Mark chapter 1, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Powerful verse that has been used wrong and taken out of context over and over again. You know, a lot of people have said over the years, as I shared with a a young soldier uh, just growing in his faith and his family growing and he, uh, he said, man, I had a lot of hellfire and brimstone growing up. That's all I ever heard. I never heard this daddy in heaven. And I'm really trying to work through that now. And I'm sorry if that's all you've ever heard. God is holy. He is sovereign. He is above everything. We do sin. We do need to repent. Now, what does the word repent mean? It means turn. Turn from my way to his way. And what is it? It's good news. 
that there's for grace, there's forgiveness. You know, the, the Bible is filled with some harsh language, but it's not really for culture, it's for the church. Over and over and over again, he hammers down on the church to say, get it right, get your focus right, remember who's the king, remember what matters most. And then he'd show incredible compassion to those who are doing some of the worst things to hurt themselves because he felt bad they were going down a path of self-destruction. And I think sometimes we just hear the turn or burn. And we forget to remind people of a father who loves them. See, he is our father, and there are going to be times that he says things that we don't like. Let me give you an example. He is not our grandfather in heaven. He's our dad in heaven. See, when I take our kids to, you know, Marcy's dad, he was so good at making sure he was going to break the ice of little kids that didn't know grandpa yet. What he'd do is he'd buy big bags of candies, especially Skittles. He would have his pockets full of them. And we're like, please, Gary, don't give so much candy this time. He's like, okay, I won't. Here, you, your grandpa loves you. <laughs> Fill him up with sugar. All they want, you want it, I'll give it to you. Now go on home. <laughs> he didn't have to take care of them. <laughs> sugar rushing on a high. And here's the thing, if not careful, that's what we're asking of God. I said, God, I want a grandpa who gives me Skittles. And we get comfortable with living in not reality, but in just lots and lots of just give me what I want. And God in heaven knows what's best for us. He runs the universe better than you or I ever could. And I'm so thankful. So the, the first question I just wanted to answer was, whose kingdom? It's his kingdom, not mine. See, my hope lies in one place, and as a church, we must remember, do I believe in, in, in being a good citizen? Absolutely. Do I want to be patriotic? Yes, absolutely. Do I want to encourage you to vote? Absolutely. But all of that is a distant second from remembering who you follow. See, we have to remember where our hope lies. It's in Jesus Christ. We could fix everything of this world. And be damned for eternity and lose everything. See, this is not my home. I'm just passing through. So let me just take a look at what kind of kingdom is God calling us to? That's the second question. See, the listeners would have heard everything as 100% political. It was all about down with Rome. Knock the Roman tower down. Get rid of their authority. We're sick of being told what to do. We're sick of their abuses. We're sick of their laws. We have to fix this. If not careful, in the church we do the same. Matthew chapter 6 May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus was not talking about political power of a nation, but he was talking about spiritually being connected with God Almighty and a kingdom that lasts forever. You know, the, the Lord's Prayer, as we call it, the disciples' prayer is connected to the Sermon on the Mount. And I think sometimes we miss this interconnection because we hear what we want to hear, but the, the context of where he was saying he was near the Sea of Galilee when he said this. Now, that's important because that was a common place that, that radicals would come out of the hills. You can see this is a picture I took when I was down there a few years ago, and it's just one of the most peaceful places in the Holy Lands, and I, I just loved it, but the hills they would hide out in, they would come out, preach and scale all their stuff, get people stirred up, and then they'd run back to the hills. And Jesus was near this, and so there's kind of, oh, he's going to come into power. We're going to, that's what we're here for. And Jesus said, let's pray thy kingdom. And they're like, that's right, Israel, you know, bring down the Romans. You know. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. There were four groups represented in Jesus' day among the Jewish audience. And let me just break them down because not much has changed. First, there were the zealots. The zealots were basically the original Assassin's Creed. They, they were just constantly jumping out. They'd stab somebody, disappear into the crowd. It was all about overthrow Rome, kill, kill, kill. It was at any cost we must come against and tear this down. And uh, it was rough. 
We also had on the other extreme, the Essenes. The Essenes were, were ones that were like, we must hide, we must get away from all the bad and all the evil. We have to pull away and just go to the hills. And, and, and it was kind of the original Amish and Mennonite kind of thing, the separatists. So we have the terrorists, and then we have the separatists, and then we have the fundamentals, the Pharisees. The Pharisees were all about legislating change. We could just get the right law in place. We could make this country moral. The nation would come under God. There would be blessings if we could only enforce morality from our government. And then you have the Sadducees who were the progressives. They were the ones who, if you can't beat them, let's just join them. Let's get what we can and let's just do what they want. And we have to go along to get along. And so they threw out a lot of their beliefs and a lot of the truth found in the Bible to just get along and not stir the pot. Four groups all wanting Jesus to be their political hero. That was the climate in which he was speaking. John chapter 6 it says, when the people saw Jesus do a miraculous sign, they exclaimed, surely he is the prophet we have been expecting. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. He's like, nope, out of here. You're not going to force me into this. They're like, no, you have to be our deliverer. He is a king, but he is a spiritual king, not an earthly king, friends. See, when he was put on trial... We have in John chapter 18, he's asked, are you a king? And he says, hey, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Now, earlier I mentioned that what kind of kingdom is so defined by how it's attached to the Sermon on the Mount? What what kind of attitude, what kind of picture, what, what kind of kingdom is it? And it's one that makes you go, whoa, but, but, but that doesn't make sense in any earthly logical argument. Let me just read this in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 3. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace for they will be called children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Jesus just flipped everything that we chase after and what we define as power, he flipped for the kingdom of God. Let me give you an example of something he did. There was one law that all of the political groups hated. They they just absolutely hated a law that Rome had put into place that said you have to carry whatever it is that a Roman soldier asks you to carry. In fact, at the Via Della Rosa where Jesus carried his uh, cross and he ran out of energy and they said, Simon, pick it up and carry it. That was a Roman law. He had to do that because they told him, carry this, so he carried it the rest of the way. It wasn't because he wanted to. It's because they had to. Now, the Pharisees got in, involved because the people hated this law so much. They were like, I don't want to carry your junk. And uh, so they legislated it down to one mile. So the maximum you had to do something for a Roman guard when he asked you to do something, a Roman soldier was carry it for one mile. And then Jesus says something as they're complaining that just rocks them. What does he say in Matthew chapter 5? If a soldier demands you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles? If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other cheek as well? Whoa, 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 Jesus, you don't understand. This is not, that's not, not no, no, you don't understand, he replies. My kingdom is not of this world, and true change does not come about through arguments, violence, or legislation, really. 
it doesn't come that way. God's change comes different. How many of you have seen somebody changed in a Facebook argument? I never thought of that before. I just read that post. I write back saying, thank you so much. I've been wrong for my whole life. This has changed my world. Thank you. I don't see that. It just doesn't happen. But how many lives have you seen changed, have I seen changed by someone loving someone sacrificially, unconditionally just giving of their life, of serving, of being peace-loving, of being merciful, of helping out the hurting. I've seen lives after life after life changed. Our culture has been changed by that kind of a movement. Oh, that the people of God would see the true kingdom. May his kingdom come and may his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We must learn to submit to the King of kings and the Lord of lords and say, may your will, not my will, be done. See, what is God's mission? It is not my mission. It's not about what law is going to give me more money at home. It's not a matter of who's going to be right this way or that way. It's, it's really about a whole other kingdom. God's mission is about eternity. And so that's where the UCC mission mashes up with the Great Commission, the Great Commandment of love God, love people, bring the two together. That changes lives. See, the early church got this. And it was incredible what happened, how it spread around the globe. And, and the poor and the rich, the wealthy and the haves and the have-nots, all. And from the widow to the orphan to the person in the palace found hope in Jesus Christ. And then about 300 years later, 312 years after the time that Jesus went to the cross, most historians would agree the worst thing ever for the church occurred. Constantine, the emperor, became a believer and something flipped. Instead of being about God's kingdom, it became about our kingdom. Instead of being about eternity, it was about right now. And all of a sudden, the church became confused about where is real power? Where is the source? And we started to make it more about God and country than just God. Let me share with you, Michael... Frost, and a quote that just challenged me deeply this week. It's a long quote, and just hold on, because there is an image in here that just went, whoa, that is so, just, it just blew me away, and I hope that you hear it as it has affected me. God can't possibly be any more powerful than he is, or reign any more than he already does. The thing that can change is that we can come into a greater realization of his reign. Let's just say that you're in a room of dirty windows and outside the room was the most beautiful sunset the world has ever seen. It is impossible for the sunset to be any more beautiful. But the people in the room haven't enjoyed the beauty of the sunset because the windows won't let them realize the beauty of the sunset. They need someone to wipe the window so they can see the reality of the beautiful, beautiful sunset. When we pray that God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, we are praying to be used by God to be window washers. We don't help God reign more. We just help people realize the victory that God has already won and the life that they can have when they realize that God is on the throne. Oh, that's good. His kingdom come. His will be done. It's amazing as we do that how many of the human problems that we struggle with are fixed when we submit to the king of kings. See, there's one place that our hope lies. As a church, there's one place. It's Jesus. I don't say that flippantly. I mean that from the depth of who I am. 
I'd like to ask you to consider standing with me and I want to turn to this traditionally called Lord's Prayer. It's just right out of Scripture. If you'd like to say this with me, just speak it out as it comes on the screen with me. And together, could we call on the Lord? Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.